live from the Mandalay Bay Convention Center in Las Vegas. It's the Cube covering VMworld 2016. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem sponsors. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Hello everyone, We're, welcome back to the VMworld 2016. This is the Cube, Silicon Angle's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from noise. I'm John Furrier, Mike. Co-host Stu Miniman and our next guest is Satin Veghani, who's the co-founder and CTO of Pernix Data, now with Nutanix. Welcome to the Cube. Congratulations! Thanks, guys, for having me. Glad uh, to be here. You are the community guest uh, voted in by the by the community as the top guest Glad they to wanted hear. to hear from. All right. So let's do it. So let's talk about what you think of the uh, keynotes today, vSAN, where VMware is going in the industry. Do you think it's a this multi-cloud thing has legs? I think so. Uh, in fact. Uh, you know, many vendors have talked about choice, right? And so it was initially about the private cloud and choice within the private cloud. Then there's a whole bunch of vendors about the public cloud. Uh, and they are, you know, kind of sort of wedded to that theme about the public cloud. Uh, but it looks like now, given the range of workloads that we are seeing in the enterprise, it seems like, you know, there is some legs to the, uh, you know, theory, at least as of now, that uh, there could be a potential to have both kinds, both flavors, first of all, and more importantly, a need for you know things to seamlessly move across, right? So I think some of my colleagues were talking about it yesterday, right? The next generation vMotion will be the vMotion that kind of liberates you from the underlying substrate. Yeah, so, uh, so, 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 Satyam, you know, you were at VMware for a number of years. Yeah. You know, want, want to get your commentary on kind of s storage and software storage because that's been changing a lot. Obviously, you, you had what you were doing at Pernix. Uh, Nutanix is uh, working on kind of not just HCI, but in many ways, you know, modernizing the, the stack itself, uh, including some competition against VMware. So, can you give us a little bit of a historical view as to how you've seen things change so fast over the last five years, and, and where do you think it's going? Well, the last five years, you know, to tell you guys frankly, you know, I didn't quite expect the type of changes we've seen in the last five years. I'd be uh, I'd be lying if I said you know everything was you know exactly according to plan, but you know kind of rewinding back a few more years to to your point, is you know when we started at VMware this was circa 2002, when we were still trying to convince the world that you know consolidating multiple operating systems on a single server is the way to go, and you know at that point, and again quite frankly just by accident, we realized that you know workload mobility is going to be a key thing in the next generation data center. And so, you know, the real uh, kind of uh, inflection point, if you will, for storage, virtualized storage, if you will, was when we decided to do something to help vMotion. So it wasn't about even about, uh, you know, storage roadmap at that point. It was about a vMotion roadmap. You know, how can we make vMotion possible? How can we make it such that the VM can move without moving its underlying storage? Because that would take days or weeks back, back in the day when you know, we are still sitting on 100 megabit Ethernet and so on. And so the first thing we realized is we shared storage was key. And so we ended up inventing a clustered file system, VMFS. That was my pet project and, uh, you know, still one of my favorite things when I look back. And, you know, that kind of set of uh, kind of a sequence of events, right, is once we did VMFS, we fell into this whole SAN world and you know, SANS did a lot to make it very optimal to run virtual machines, but, you know, the end of, end of the day, we realized that there were just a lot of players, you know, there was a switch administrator, there was a storage admin, there was a server admin, and so that, of course, led to, you know, hyperconvergence and the vSAN and the Nutanixes of the world. Uh, and then, of course, there was, in parallel, there was this other thread, which was storage was becoming faster than we had ever imagined, and it still kind of keeps going probably even faster than the rate at which processors are evolving. And that made it very important for applications to run right next to storage, or the other way around. Uh, and, and so, you know, server-side technologies were very important. Yeah, so, so Satyam, I mean, you, you created VMFS. I mean, that, that was, you know, transformational for VMware going forward. Yeah. You know, we think back to the early days. I mean, I remember when I saw vMotion for the first time, it blew everybody's it mind. Magical, we, right? We've all talked about it. It's still yeah. differentiation for VMware. So a question for you, and you know, maybe it's a little personal, but is VMFS long in the tooth now? Uh, does there need to be reinvention? You know, what, what do you think about kind of the VMware stack and, and where things need to go? I think so, uh, to be honest. You know, uh, it is showing a sign of its age. 
But, uh, you know, I, I say this often. In fact, I was speaking at a Vima keynote uh, a few months ago. And the first thing to realize about any technology is that it's going to get disrupted. You know, yeah. the, the worst thing you could do after inventing a technology is getting too focused on that one thing and assuming that that's going to last a decade or two decades. You know, it just doesn't happen, especially in today's world. And so, yes, it is long in the tooth, but, you know, back in the day when it used to be highly relevant, it did a fabulous job. You know, many people talk, have great stories about how shared storage and vMotion absolutely changed how they run their IT infrastructure. And now it's time to move on, you know. Now it's time to actually focus on storage class memory, server-side media, because, again, devices are just getting too fast for the networks to be a bottleneck. And, uh, and that's life. Uh, it, you know, nothing, nothing surprising, if you ask As me. As Stu says, it's always move, shifting the bottleneck somewhere else. There's yeah. no networking parlance there. But th that brings up the point around the data. Uh -huh. Right now, to us, at least we were just commenting on the, on the opening about the data is the competitive advantage opportunity. Absolutely. And being open and not proprietary doesn't exist anymore. You use open source. I mean, mm -hmm. But being using open source doesn't mean you're open. Yeah. So there's now a nuance around not proprietary, but lock-in spec with being sticky with the data. Absolutely. So we're trying to understand, love to get your thoughts on how you see that because that will truly define multiple clouds because if Microsoft comes out and says, hey, we're going to create some stickiness with the data right. or we're open, yeah. technically you could move your data, <laughs> but moving it across the network again is another problem. Yeah, that's so true. So what needs to be in place in your mind to truly have open cloud hmm. for the data and the data area? I guess that's a five-year question, but you know, I'll, I'll take a swing at it. Th yeah. That's a great question. Shoot by the way. arrow forward. I mean, we're speculating, yeah. so we're, we're yeah. riffing. But yeah, go ahead. Well, so the first thing about data is, at least if you look back on the past few years, uh, we, at least in the storage ecosystem, have focused a lot on data services around a blob that is otherwise impenetrable, right? So you know, you have a virtual disk or blob storage. You don't quite know what the application is doing inside the blob, but it's, you know you still try to guarantee some quality of service on that blob, you know, whether it's IOPS, latency, or you know, some amount of replication or snapshotting. But I think now we are all realizing that we need to peek inside that blob. Uh, it's all about the applications, but to understand what the application is doing, you need to have that level of transparency. So I think uh, in my uh, you know, very you know, uh, not so formed opinion yet, uh, I'm also kind of sort of seeing how it evolves, but in my opinion, so far, uh, you know, we are going to first phase, kind of go into this phase where a lot of vendors, including possibly Nutanix, is going to try to break into through that opaqueness, you know, around users' data and actually, you know, help people understand what makes up an application, and then you know, try to do some interesting management capabilities around different components, different data components that make up an application. And just to give you a very simple example, you know. A database is not just a blob, right? A database is some table space, there's some log space, there's some temp space. So, and, and different types of data types require different service levels and different types of management and different lifecycle management. So I think we are going to see a lot of vendors who don't quite have the keys to those applications try to break in. So that's, I think, going to be the first phase. But then, I think in the second phase, we are going to see some standardization, right? As we'll the infrastructure vendors will work with the app vendors to somehow standardize the, appli the application to infrastructure interface so that we can do many more kind of application-oriented services, but inside the infrastructure. Yeah, so you bring up, I think, a key point I want our audience to understand about what you've been doing at Pernix Data, because mm -hmm. there's some people look at, uh, like, you know, not to trivialize it, but, oh, they, they help performance, and especially mm -hmm. with Flash, and I can take something older and make it run a little bit better, uh, but it's the analytics. Um, and we understand the storage industry, we've been talking for many years now, it's not just about storing, but how do I leverage data. As John was saying, you see Nimble Storage, what they're doing with the analytics. Yeah. A lot of storage and networking companies are really trying to get in there, leverage that, and pull out of it. So can you talk to us, I know you probably can't share you know, what Nutanix plus Pernix will be, but you know, what the analytics is, where you're looking at taking that, and that's the kind of core to what you've been doing the last couple of years. Oh, for sure, and by the way, thanks for recognizing that, right, because in fact, analytics is a new thing, and I think you know when faced with a new thing, everybody tries to jump on the bandwagon, but there are some key requirements to make analytics successful. But anyway, before I go there, uh, you know this is something that also excites me about the Nutanix Pernix data marriage, and you know maybe I'll try to paint you a picture 
uh, given that uh, we guys go a uh, long way back, is, you know, we, both the companies, I see so many synergies, you know, back in the day, both the companies realized that server-side was the place to be just by virtue of how media was evolving. Uh, and then by virtue of the fact that, you know, data centers were becoming this huge conglomeration of servers and the boundaries between servers were vanishing. And so we made a distributed platform that gave you scale-out performance. Nutanix did so as well. The only difference was they brought in capacity, we didn't. And there were good reasons to do it either way. But then both companies realized that a product doesn't make a company. And so we realized that, you know, the next level of value add, uh, you know, storage is going to be storage. You know, there's only so many ways you can do RAID and snapshotting and so on. So the next level of value add is indeed analytics, you know, to make people actually to help them understand what's going on in their data center. That was a key behind Architect, which was a Pernix data product. That's also the key behind Prism, which is a Nutanix product. And so just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea about what the future holds, you know, I think we have a lot of work that we can bring in, you know, all the work that we did around Pernix data architect. We can bring, the, bring that in, into the Prism platform. But then there's also the other angle, which is, you know, Prism as a platform so far helps the hyperconverged part of the data center. And so the other question is, hey, can we actually help a much broader part of the you know, data center, the next generation data center? And that broader part of the data center spans legacy infrastructure. It also spans some amount of cloud, right? Um, so then talking about analytics itself, you know, I'll just say one thing, which is you know, right now uh, we are in this phase where we try to collect a lot of data, but you know, right now the server side seems to be at a at a huge advantage when it comes to analytics because if you are there, just like you saw in the VMware keynote, you know, there's the network virtualization assets, there's the storage virtualization assets, and then there's, of course, the compute assets. Uh, other people like Nutanix have it too. And so having all those assets lets you get a holistic view of the data center and feed that into your analytics system as opposed to a storage-only view or a compute-only view or a network-only view. And I think that's going to be a key differentiator, just kind of starting out of the gate. I think one of the things that excites me about this conversation, one, is we're kind of you know, painting a picture about what the future might hold and certainly what you guys have been doing with Nutanix kind of, kind of teases, out, teases out a future. But the reality is on the app side, app developer side, um, this whole data ecosystem, whether it's Hadoop or databases yeah. in general, have always been kind of a systems of record model. And now with real-time data, you don't know which data you might need from a different database. So you're seeing the, the mega trend being that data from every database will need to at least be exposed to some level of intelligence. So, you know, this has really not been worked on. You guys are really cracking the code not. on this. So um, it's at the beginning stages of this uh, opening up of metadata, about the metadata, if you will. Absolutely. Um, how early are we? I mean, we're kind of like at pre pre-gaming this thing? I mean, what's your thoughts? I mean, because that's where the, everyone struggles at the, these analytics yeah. shows with you know, the power of the data. Hmm. I think, uh, well, maybe I'll explain it through an example. Is Back in the day, I think it was 2005 or 2004, we had VMFS and somebody out in the open reverse engineered the VMFS on disk format and then they <laughs> made a Java application and, you know, it was a VMFS file system driver. It was read-only because, you know, they couldn't figure out transactions, but, you know, you could at least read data. And so I think that's how early we are is, you know, there's too many applications to worry about, at least in the enterprise. And, and so we are probably in the phase where we are not going to see too much standardization because we don't even quite understand the scope of the problem to standardize, right? And so the first thing we'll do is we'll hack. We'll, you know, so that's the, that's the creative how phase. we are. The that's creative, the creative you know, phase, the hacking that's, is, that's no, it's true, I mean, yeah. we're hacking around. It's hard to standardize, but you don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the hardest part of, of this hacking phase right now that you see, or what's the exciting area, hard, exciting? Uh, it's kind of the same thing and from a hacker standpoint. Well, the hardest part will be, you know, well, uh, I'll answer in the technology sense and the business sense, right? And, the business sense, the hardest part will be, you know, uh, like it or not, uh, you know, we are all frenemies, right? So when we start adding value beyond a point, you know, people stop being friends. And so, you know, we are in this phase where we really need to be friends to understand each other's applications. The infrastructure guy needs to understand the application. The app guy needs to understand infrastructure 
you might say, why? Because the app guy might want to orchestrate infrastructure changes, right, to make the app perform better. And so we really need to be in that friend phase. But, you know, unfortunately, as we add more and more value, that's going to break down. So I think that's the kind of key problem I see on the business side. And on the technology side, I see, you know, you yourself, you know, the examples you gave, right, Hadoop, MongoDB, you know, all those things are moving so fast, you know. We thought Apache Spark was the thing, and, you know, suddenly now there's this new thing called Flink, and, you know, people are, and so there's, you know, it's moving it's like so a, fast. It's like nightclubs. I mean, you know, one's trending one day, it closes <laughs> it down, go. and a new one opens up. I mean, but there this is open go. source communities. They move with the yeah. trends, so yeah. it's fashionable, if you will, to exactly. you know, never fight fashion, as they say. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, because it's moving so fast, just by the time you think you have figured out the whole life cycle, you have figured out the marriage, you know, the orchestration, you know, the party somewhere else, to use your analogy. Yeah, right? I, I mean, you bring up a really good point. If you look at a lot of those modern applications, it has different requirements from kind of the storage side and might even have challenges with virtualization. How, how do you take that into account? How do you think of kind of some of those new applications that might not fit into kind of our traditional buckets? Actually, that's a great question. So, you know, again, honestly speaking, uh, the canvas is yet to be painted. I think we'd be very, very wrong in assuming that everything we've invented over the last 10 years, or in the last five years for that matter, will just, you know, we slap it on and it's just going to work. And in fact, that's the exciting part, right? Is, you know, there is so much, uh, you know, potential for innovation here, as long as we have an open mind, as long as we don't kind of just you know, get to marriage. And so, again, to answer your question slightly more directly, uh, I think, uh, and through an example for, you know, for that matter, uh, storage class memory, right? You know, there is, a, there is a school of thought which says that, you know, the right way to use storage class memory is to give it directly to the application. And that's the only way because it is so damn fast that anything in the middle is going to, you know, be pure overhead. But then there's this other school of thought, which is more infrastructure-centric, that, hey, you know, there are some infrastructure services which are better off done once and perfected once, especially when it comes to data, right? You know, making versions of data, sending it off to across a wide area network and so on and so forth. You know, all those services are so difficult to build that you don't want to build it a thousand times for a thousand different applications. So I think we are going to see this tension between the two schools of thoughts. Uh, I think, you know, the I'm assuming the will eventually settle, uh, settle somewhere in the middle. But uh, then the real question is, who is going to get there fastest, right? And uh, again, not to pitch this, but I, that's the other thing that uh, excited us about the Nutanix Pernix data marriage, right? Is, yeah, we, don't, we are on the server side, we see applications, we see these ridiculously high-speed media types evolve, and maybe we can do something about it. And it could, you know, be an addition to the stack that we already have, or it could actually be a disruption to the stack. Satyam, final question uh, for you before we wrap up is, your take on the ecosystem, obviously the VMware has always had a robust ecosystem, then there's been kind of, when always these shifts are happening, the ecosystem will move, won't be long in the tooth as well, we'll have to shift and get disrupted again. But now we're seeing an ecosystem 2.0 going on. Sure. So you have a lot of partners with VMware, they have a partnering strategy, well, how does the ecosystem evolve in your mind, your vision of, of where the ecosystem might go to, how it might evolve? Obviously, cloud will be one. Um, do you see any major shifts in the ecosystem? Uh, I do. And uh, some of it is worrisome, especially, you know, because I love this ecosystem. I've spent uh, so much time at VMware. Uh, worrisome in a good way um, is, you know, the disruptive evolution would be the ecosystem pretty much just, you know, wholesale migrates to maybe potentially a new queen bee, so to speak. <laughs> and the queen bee could potentially be the Amazons of the world. Uh, but that's also the uh, opportunity that uh, companies like VMware have is, you know, to show us the path, you know, all of us as VMware partners. You know, if we can cooperate enough instead of, uh, you know, uh, facing too much friction between ourselves, then maybe we can all together move into where the kind of puck is at, right? Which is pro probably the public cloud or the manager of the private and public cloud. I hope to have Raghu on the cube. I saw him last night at uh, uh, one of the, the press analyst event, and we were talking about that, that particular point, mainly also the data aspect of things uh, and becoming less friction. So yeah, we'll keep an eye on it. 
Satyam, thanks so much for coming on the Cube. Appreciate the commentary. Great conversation. Thanks so uh, And congratulations on your, uh, your sale to Nutanix. Great partnership. It looks like it's got a lot of great synergies there. Looking forward to hearing more. This is the Cube here at VMworld 2016. I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman. We'll be right back with more after this short break. Thank <laughs> you.